Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, this first of hopefully a few uh, quarters of um, what you need to know. Um, we call this one uh, year end tax strategies, what you need to know. Um, I'm Steve Bereen, and I have here with me my uh, partner, John Bereen. Uh, we are delighted to have you attend, delighted to have so many of you attend today. Um, we are recording this and we'll make this available in its entirety, but also in terms of smaller uh, segments, it'll be available on our website. We also have a tax handout uh, that we'll be emailing to each of you. Uh, it is uh, the entire tax code on uh, a front back. It doesn't come laminated unless you bring it in and, or ask us to laminate it for you. Uh, so our goal today is uh, to help you to make wise choices with your resources, uh, to have good behavior in response to tax law changes that are coming up or, or that may come up, uh, to help you to match um, your goals, your resources, your property with the environment that we work in. Um, 2021 has been such a fascinating year. Um, as we reflect back and look back uh, on this year, um, I recall at the beginning of the year, everyone seemed to be wringing their hands, worried about how tax law was going to change dramatically. Uh, maybe some of you recall some of that when there was talk of eliminating capital gains tax, uh, the, the elimination of capital gains tax rates, which today we are taxed at a lower level for capital gains than ordinary income. Also, the idea that dividends would be taxed at a lower rate was, um, was tossed out there. The elimination of the step up in basis for uh, securities that you may um, uh, have inherited years ago or have purchased years ago. Uh, the elimination of 1031 exchanges with real estate, uh, all of these uh, balloons, if you will, uh, were a lot of noise. And it was a lot of noise to get people all wound up about lots of changes. And that no doubt created lots of questions that people had. What should I do? Should I do something now? Should I do something ahead of this tax law change that's going to come about? So when we were thinking about this, developing the idea back in September, October, we thought, well, let's pick a date and let's do a Zoom to our clients and bring in the conversation. And we thought, heavens, by December 1st, certainly Congress will have made up their mind on what they're going to do or what they're not going to do. And we'd have clarity about that. So here we are, December 1st, noon. Again, thank you for joining us. And how much clarity do we have? Well, yes, they've signed a bill. A bill has been passed and signed and there are some tax provisions in it, but absolutely none of those tax provisions apply to really our audience, our clients, you. Um, uh, few and far in between uh, uh, things have, have become clear. So we were hoping to be able to share with you some key points of things you should do, need to do, should not do, um, but it's still very murky. So, um, with that, um, what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about the perspective, some perspective, where we have been and where we are today. Uh, then we will look at you know, some changes that occurred, occurred with the SECURE Act and the CARES Act that impact, impact all of us in 2021. Um, and then you know, what does it look like for the Build Back Better uh, uh, plan? Um, the fact that there's pressure for more revenue, where does it come from? Um, some must do's, some absolutely don't do's, um, some ideas on uh, Roths and gifting, some changes that are occurring there. And then we have a couple of unanswerable questions. You know, are my tax rates gonna go up? What can I do? 
So if in this whole conversation, you have questions, feel free to use the chat uh, box at the very bottom of your screen. There's a little box there, just hit chat and you'll be able to um, provide us with questions. Uh, we've already started to receive a couple of questions. Um, we'll be going through those. So about 30 minutes of content and then about uh, 20 or 30 minutes of Q&A. Um, as I said, this is, uh, will be recorded, is being recorded and will be up on our website. We'll send you a follow-up email giving you the link for that, uh, the direction for that, and then also um, the uh, PDF of the one page, uh, all you needed to know about the tax code in one simple uh, sheet. Um, so so um, perspective. Um, the last administration in 2017 passed a tax uh, bill, December of 2017, it was called the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And it was designed to do that, to stimulate jobs and also to create some tax cuts. Well, it did exactly that. It cut uh, tax rates, dropped the top marginal tax rate. And sorry that the print is so small on this, but this is what you will, you'll be receiving. The top marginal rate dropped from 39.6 to 37%, um, which helped, uh, the higher income people, but it also dropped some of the marginal rates uh, 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 for lower bracketed people. The idea of brackets is something that's real important to understand. That's how our tax code works. And um, uh, it's very helpful for you to be thinking about those brackets as you think about taking income or receiving income um, um, because as you receive and take income, um, you push yourself into those, those different brackets. Um, the other things that that tax law did in 2017 is it, is it increased the standard deduction. And today the standard deduction is you know 21,000 or so. Uh, it's a little bit higher when you're over 65, you get a little additional break. And what that did is it, eliminated lots of people uh, itemizing their taxes uh, in their tax return. So what it, what it caused actually is many more people to use the standard deduction uh, as opposed to itemizing. So there's some pros and there are cons, some cons with that. Um, it increased uh, taxes on the wealthy, especially with the SALT deduction being pulled back so much. SALT is the acronym for state and local taxes. So it used to be uh, pre that uh, 17 act uh, that you could deduct your state income tax, your local property taxes, and people who are in uh, high income tax states or who have uh, lots of real estate property were able to deduct, deduct those uh, taxes paid. Well, the uh, Trump administration dropped that down to a $10,000 maximum. Uh, and no doubt that created some wailing from uh, consti constituents. Um, what's fascinating is that's being brought back um, um, uh, for the benefit of, of uh, primarily the, the wealthiest in our country. Um, the reduction in corporate income tax also was rather substantial, dropping corporate taxes from 35% to 21%. Um, uh, so we had those, those tax cuts that, that occurred. Uh, then in 2019, we had the SECURE Act come along and the SECURE Act uh, changed the required minimum distribution. It bumped that from, from age 70 and a half to age 72 and why the tax code would choose 70 and a half or 59 and a half you know, we're not quite sure where they come up with some of the rules but uh, regardless the secure act bumped the rmds uh, up to age 72 so this year you're able to uh, you're required to begin taking distributions from iras if you're over age 72 
under, under age 72, you don't have to, to do that. The CARES Act came along and provided lots of lending that helped people through COVID uh, and gave people a RMD holiday in 2020. So uh, in March of 2020, uh, after that point in time, people uh, could defer or, or not take their RMD in the tax year 2020. Um, the other thing that happened or, or is an interesting spin on this is uh, qualified charitable the, uh, uh, distributions. So um, we'll talk a little bit about this a little bit later, but a qualified charitable distribution is a way to satisfy the required minimum distribution from an IRA, but give directly to a charitable charity. So if you're charitably inclined, it's a very efficient way. In fact, it's probably the most efficient and the most effective way to make your charitable gifts directly from your IRA to those charities. Satisfies the required distribution. It does not pass through your tax return, which can change some other things like raising your taxable income, which raises your Medicare tax, something some people are introduced to this lady called Irma. Um, so this does not count toward that. Um, it, it just, it's much more efficient to do your charitable gifting that way. So we'll talk about that uh, later, later on here. Um, so, um, oh, one other thing um, the, uh, the, the SECURE Act did is it eliminated the ability to do, to do a stretch IRA. So previously, if someone inherited, if a non-spouse, a child, for instance, inherited an IRA from someone, they were able to take the required distributions out throughout their lifetime. That now has been changed such that they're required to take the required distributions within a 10 year period. So someone can take some in the third year or the fifth year or the ninth year, but an inherited IRA for the new law, folks, has to be fully withdrawn within the 10-year period. If you inherited an IRA prior to that CARES Act, well, you're under the old rules, so you're able to take it out over a full life expectancy. So a couple of those changes. Well, today we have the Build Back Better Act. And again, there's all kinds of trial balloons that are going up in terms of what to do, what to, uh, what, you know, what to do. Raising marginal rates, that's been talked about. Changing the taxes for those people that earn over a million dollars. Uh, changing it to those earning over $10 million. Putting additional uh, stacked taxes. Um, raising the capital gains tax rate on people. Lowering the estate tax deduction. We've talked about doing that. Um, we'll talk about estate taxes, raising corporate income taxes back to uh, a 35% uh, uh, rate. And then lastly, creating a minimum tax for corporations. Some corporations uh, uh, take an aggressive stand or, or aggressively use the tax code to, to avoid paying any income taxes. Um, a company that probably all of us use, Amazon, does exactly that. They, they use the tax code to um, basically not have to pay a corporate income tax. Um, uh, Congress has talked about eliminating that, uh, that provision and raising that. Um, the reality is corporations don't pay corporate income tax. Consumers pay corporate income tax. Um, it's part of the cost of goods sold. Um, for instance, if, if Coca-Cola makes a can of Coke for 79 cents and, and assume that all of that is profit and there's a 21 cent tax or 21% tax, the 21 cents that's added onto that brings the cost of that can of Coke up to a dollar. That's what we pay is a dollar. 
So the taxes are built into the cost of goods sold. So when you hear politicians talk about corporations paying their fair share, well, corporations don't pay taxes. It's included into the cost of goods sold. In other words, included into the cost of the goods and services that we buy from those corporations. So we pay corporate income tax. It's just built into the price of what we pay. So kind of enough on that. So there's tremendous uh, pressure to raise revenues, which means raise taxes. The details, we really don't know. We don't know what those details are. The, the fascinating thing about it is the math really doesn't seem to work out. There's talk about raising taxes on the top 1% and, and lowering taxes for the 99%. But the reality is the taxes on the top 1%, which works out to be about 1.4 million households. So that would reflect what the top 1% would be. If you raised their taxes, $55,000, which is kind of what they're talking about. Simple math, multiply 1.4 million times $55,000 and you get $76 billion. Well, 76 billion in new revenues does not seem to equate with 1.5 billion in build back or 1.5 trillion, excuse me, 1.5 trillion in new spending. So we don't know what those details are gonna look like. We do know that there's gonna be some pressure on, on raising taxes, but raising taxes on the top 1%, you won't cut it. And you've probably heard people talk about that, but there's just not enough. The math doesn't seem to work. Math has never been a strength of Congress, uh, uh, especially in terms of balancing budgets and spending and revenue. So we all know that. So they've talked about, about raising the marginal rates from 37 to 39, could happen. That'll change things a little bit. They've also talked about raising the social security threshold. So right now, if you're, uh, uh, if, you, if you have high income, you don't pay taxes over a certain level with social security. So if they were to eliminate that so that you paid social security taxes on all of your income above, and I believe it's 130, 131, that would raise some tax revenues, but it would be revenues to fund social security, not fund um, other, spending. other spending. So it would help the social security system become more solvent, but it's not gonna help in the solvency of, of the other spending. So uh, and I just find it interesting that the salt tax repeal really benefits the wealthy. It benefits the wealthiest people out there that have high state income taxes and high uh, property taxes. So just interesting. So we thought that we would have clarity about this when we when we decided to, to offer this to our clients. Unfortunately, uh, things are still pretty murky. So what should you do? Um, so um, must-dos. You absolutely should contribute to your retirement plan if you are an employee or if you're employed into a 401k, into, into uh, simple IRAs. Yeah, so if you're employed, you should be contributing the maximum into that. Um, if you're self-employed uh, or have your own business, you can contribute 25% of your compensation into a, um, uh, into a uh, SEP plan, Simplified Employee Pension. It's like a big IRA. The dollar limit that you can put into that is 58,000. Um, you, if you're in a high deductible health insurance plan, you uh, have the capability to put money into a health savings account. That's a great thing to do because you get to deduct what you put into the health savings account. 
and you get to then pay for your medical costs with pre-tax dollars, which are bigger dollars. Um, if you're uh, able to contribute to a Roth, you absolutely should do that. Um, unfortunately, the government has a, what's called a phase out rule, which means if you earn too much money, they don't want you to be saving in retirement vis-a-vis uh, -vis a Roth account. Um, kind of a odd thing that they, that they um, uh, discourage good behavior, good savings behavior. So um, the other thing to make sure you are doing, and that is make sure you're talking with your CPA, your tax advisor, and that you're collaborating with them for, for ways that you can lower your taxable income or move money between your, um, your portfolios to, to maximize your benefit. So, um, and we obviously are happy to collaborate with you and your CPA to help you make, the, make, make wise choices with your resources. Um, what you absolutely should not do uh, is take money out of a 401k or a retirement account to pay bills. And we don't see that so much with our clientele, but we do hear about it uh, quite a bit. Um, you should be very careful if you've taken some property, some real estate property that you have converted from personal property to rental, and then go ahead and going ahead and selling it. Uh, again, that's something you want to make sure you talk with your CPA, make sure you don't violate any of the um, two and five year rules uh, of that. Um, absolutely be careful about making changes to your investment portfolio just for tax purposes. Um, and we cringe when we see this, but chasing tax deduction investments just for the deductions. Um, uh, at this time of the year, you see a lot of that. So, um, so those are some of the do's and, and, and don't do's. Um, Roth IRAs. <clears throat> you might consider converting some of your pre-tax IRA to a Roth IRA. Um, if you're in a artificially low bracket at this time of the year or at this time, by doing that, you are paying a lower tax rate on dollars that you're converting into a Roth. This is especially good for, <clears throat> for clients that may have retired early. So they retired in their early 60s and have not yet started Social Security. So they're in a window of time where they have, like Steve said, an artificially low taxable income. And by converting some money into the Roth, you're paying taxes at a lower rate. Then you're also locking in this tax-free growth inside of a Roth IRA. It's a great way to do things. In some ways, it's also, you know, if, you, if, if uh, you're not likely to spend all of your IRA or use all of your IRA during your life, in a way, you're paying the taxes for your inheritors. But it's, it's, it can be an effective way to... Uh, uh, pay taxes on those dollars at a relatively low rate for a window of, of time before your income might jump back up when Social Security starts or when required distributions start. Yeah. Uh, another thing to do to consider um, if you have children that you obviously love or grandchildren that we all love, um, consider uh, helping them get started with a Roth. So what's the advantage? Well, the advantage is every dollar that goes into that account earns tax-free forever. And yes, you'll hear people talk about they're going to take away that benefit as well. I, I don't think so. Um, the, Congress has enough political power to make that dramatic of a change. But that money compounding over time tax-free is an incredible gift to them. And so um, if you'd ever like to talk about that one-on-one, -on -one, we are delighted to, to uh, visit with you and, and the circumstance, the situations that you may have. 
putting money into a Roth for a young person creates an unfair advantage for them. And we love unfair advantages. We all want an unfair advantage, but they have a tremendous unfair advantage if starting a, a, a Roth for them at a very young age. They have to have earned income. Uh, and this is something that you wanna coordinate with your CPA, but uh, a wonderful thing to do. It's very, it's well worth the squeeze, especially, you know, for, for a young person that's in their, you know, late teens working or early 20s to have 40 or 50 years of, of compounding. It's a little extra effort on the tax, initial tax side, but the long-term benefit of it is absolutely dramatic for their, for their future. Yep. Huge blessing, huge yep. gift. So we've heard about this thing called a backdoor rock. What is that? One of the... Um, one of the silly things about contributing to a Roth, like Steve mentioned, is that there's an income threshold. So you can contribute to a Roth, um, just like adding to any other account, up to a certain limit, but you have to have uh, income below about $210,000 uh, as a couple. And I think it's about 140 single. And, so, and it has to be earned income. So if you're retired and thinking, gee, I want to do a backdoor Roth, unfortunately, the laws don't permit you to, to contribute if you have unearned income. Right. And so um, one of the things that we do for, for a lot of clients, especially younger clients that are higher earners or over that $210,000 income level, we'll help them complete what's called a backdoor Roth contribution. Now, it's several steps. It's a little bit more effort and legwork. But again, it's very well worth the, worth the time and energy to do that because you're getting this tax-free a compound and growth on it. And, and effectively, the process for that is by making a non-deductible contribution into an IRA. And then the next day, we will convert that into a Roth. You're flushing money basically through a non-deductible IRA, which doesn't have any uh, income caps, and then getting it into a Roth IRA. You can get it into a, a Roth that you already have, or we start new ones. And we try to do this every single year for clients while we can, while the rules are, are there and available. We don't know if they're gonna change, but we know that they're there now. So we take advantage of that. One of the, uh, let me put it this way. It's not possible in all situations for clients that already have uh, existing IRAs. There's a, another IRS rule called the pro rata rule, which effectively spoils it. I won't go into the detail of it because it makes my head spin and it will certainly confuse things. But if you don't have an IRA, then making a backdoor Roth as a young person, higher earning makes a ton of sense. So grandkids or, or kids makes a ton of sense. Um, even, you know, people in their, in their late forties and fifties, the, the, the benefit of tax-free growth in a Roth is, is undeniable. So that's something that we do for clients. But again, if, if you do have an existing IRA, uh, that can kind of spoil the ability to do a backdoor Roth if you're making over $200,000, $210,000 as a, as a couple. So wonderful advantage, tax-free compounding forever. Um, but certainly case-by-case -case, uh, situations that, that we happily have conversations about. So one of the areas that people have asked about um, Related is related to um, well unanswerable questions. Are taxes going up? We don't know. We absolutely don't know. There certainly seems to be pressure to have that happen, but but we don't know what's going to happen there. Um, kind of an unanswerable question number two, and that is how can I avoid paying taxes? Well, you want to. Uh, coordinate with your CPA and, and visit with them to see if there's anything that you can do. Some things you can do, you can consider bunching your deductions into one year. So today, most people are using the standard deduction and getting a, uh, basically a, a $20,000, $25,000 um, standard deduction. Um, Bunching your 
contributions as an example into one year, you can, you can do that. Um, and in doing so, you would, you would itemize in a, maybe every third year. So if you uh, gave away $15,000 a year in, in charitable deductions and, and bunch them into one year, 15 times three is 45,000, you then receive a $45,000 deduction that one year. Uh, it would allow you to itemize that, that one year, but you'd have to make those deductions in that one year, or you could, you could make those contributions to a donor advised fund uh, that allows you to put a larger lump sum of money into uh, for, for a charitable de deduction, but then distribute that out over time. Uh, that's what a, a donor advised fund will enable you to do. And again, we are happy to visit with clients one-on-one -on -one, uh, for um, uh, strategies like that. Uh, so um, in the chat box um, there at the bottom, if you have uh, uh, specific questions, uh, feel free to chime in. Um, One question we've uh, uh, got, thanks Jeannie, is can you contribute into an HSA if you are already on and participating in Medicare or I should say receiving Medicare? And the answer is no. You have to be in a high deductible plan to be able to do that, um, unfortunately. So um, here's a question. Um, does all this changing in terms of gifting, uh, in other words, gifting to non-charities, what's, what's the changes there? Well, in 2021, the gift tax limit is $15,000. So you can, any, any one individual can gift to any other individual $15,000 this year. Uh, next year, that's going to move up to $16,000. Um, it's interesting that they uh, bump that in $1,000 increments. Um, the guys that wrote that part of the, the tax code at least are keeping that part portion simple. Um, the estate tax deduction is 11,700,000 this year. And what that means is that each person has a deduction for uh, a good description. They have an 11,700,000 dollar deduction against their estate uh, to, to not pay estate taxes. So for a couple, it's $23,400 this year. Next year in 2022, that jumps up to 11 million, about, about me, 12 million, 12 million 60. So, if you need motivation to make it through the month, you get a higher uh, estate tax deduction. Uh, it's uh, 12 million 60,000 60, for uh, 2022. Um, we always encourage our clients to make sure that they've reviewed their will and that their estate plan is the way they want it. Um, the will is really the direction. We, whenever we meet with you, we always review your beneficiaries. Why? Because what we have on file here for you is where the money that's here is going to go. No matter what your will says, what we have on file here is where the money goes. It does not pass through the will. It's simple. It, goes to your beneficiary. So we always encourage you to, to review that. And it's worth taking a look at it every few years, making sure uh, that those things are right. Um, here's another question. Um, should I convert my pre-tax IRA to a Roth? Well, John kind of talked about that. It really depends upon the bracket that you are in. If you are in a lower bracket today, it can, make, it can make sense to do that. But in essence, what you're doing by converting is you're prepaying the income taxes on that money. And some people like to do that. Some people prefer not to do that. Uh, but that's basically what you're doing. Um, and also in relation to making an IRA to Roth conversion, um, some people will, will, will 
uh, inquire if they can take an inherited or beneficiary IRA and convert that into a Roth. The beneficiary IRA or the inherited IRA has to stay as is. It cannot be moved into a tax-free Roth. Effectively, that those dollars have to, like Steve said in the new rules, in within 10 years, they have to come out of the IRA package, go through the tax code, and then they become your after-tax dollars. Now, if you have after-tax dollars, and then you can, can, can contribute that to a Roth, that would be a way of doing it. But still, you have to take them out of the beneficiary IRA and then contribute it to a Roth rather than converting it to the Roth. There's a, there's a nuanced difference in the, in the tax code to that, but that's how you would affect any of that type of change. Don't you just love these rules that just make, make it so complicated? And we didn't mention this uh, uh, in the beginning, but Steve and I, we, we, uh, we grabbed a CPA and said, hey, get in the audience with us because we're not CPAs. We don't know all the rules. We experience a lot of this in, in our work, but we don't know everything. So uh, Wendy is certainly uh, uh, here and, and can raise her hand and correct us if we uh, misspeak in one way or another. Yeah. So Wendy Campbell, yeah. fabulous CPA. So um, should I make charitable gifts from my IRA, which is what I talked about earlier, a qualified charitable gift or QCG? Um, yes, if you're charitably inclined, it's a very efficient way to make gifts to charities. Um, it, um, it's the most efficient way to, to make those gifts. And again, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, if you would like to visit with us on that, we're, we're delighted to do that. We're big believers in that. And, and no children are not charities, although some, some kids might be. Might be. Um, one one uh, question in relation to charitable um, uh, contributions, especially related to required distributions, is can you take a, a, a required distribution and put it into a donor advised fund? Yeah. Yeah. And the answer is no. Unfortunately, that's something that uh, the, uh, the rules do not permit us to, to be able to do that. A, a donor advised fund, wonderful wonderful thing to do, wonderful way to um, give a large lump of capital uh, to share with, with charities. Um, receive, then, then feathering it out gradually. Right. You receive the deduction in the year you make the charitable gift to the donor advised fund, but um, taking dollars from the IRA into a donor advised fund, um, you're not able to do that. You, you can make charities the beneficiaries of an IRA if, if you're so inclined to do that. So, uh, so. Another question we have is effectively, can anybody convert a, a portion of their IRA into a Roth IRA mm -hmm. uh, and pay income taxes on that? Yes, you can make that conversion. Mm -hmm. When you do, you, you don't have to have taxable income like you do on a contribution. That's one of the differences between converting and contributing. But yes, you can make that uh, conversion from an IRA to a Roth, pay the taxes, and then you'd experience the, uh, uh, the increased income taxable or uh, reportable income uh, on your taxes for the year that you do that. So uh, another question we have is, How's your, how's your tax bracket determined uh, when you're in retirement and how does that um, uh, dictate the taxation on your, your 401k? Um, let's see. All of your tax bracket um, in retirement is effectively all the income that you receive. So via social security, uh, pensions, um, uh, any distributions out of your, uh, uh, your pre-tax dollars, your 401ks, your IRAs, any uh, uh, dividends or reportable income from after-tax dollars. All of those things are effectively added up to uh, create your tax number. Uh, and that puts you in the bracket that, uh, uh, that you would be reporting in. So I was doing a little bit of 
brush up reading uh, last evening, just to kind of glance at things. And, and I chuckled about this tax code on two pages. And uh, there's been some folklore about, you know, how many words are in the tax code, uh, whether it's more words than they're in the Bible and all, all of that. Uh, this we will we will send out to you for the 2021. And since 2021 is really only good for another 30 days, um, we'll be sending out the 2022 if, if, you, uh, if you would like it. Um, so as soon as we have the updated numbers, the updated brackets. Um, so um, one last question we have um, from Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, is can my kids contribute more than what they earn? Mm -hmm. If you have a, a teenager who's lifeguarding or something like that, can they put in $6,000, the maximum for a Roth, if they earned $4,000. That's one of the limits. You can only put in up to the amount, or you can only uh, put in either the maximum, 6,000, or up to what you've earned. So if they earn four, they can only put in $4,000 into the Roth. Or their parents could give them a bonus. Or they could shovel the lock for two grand. So, 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 um, so, we hope that this time has been valuable for you, uh, that it helps you to make wise decisions, wise choices with your resources. Uh, I mentioned at the outset that we uh, have the idea to do this on a quarterly basis, but on topics that are much better than just what tax rates are. And um, one of the other areas that we receive questions on relates to estate planning. Um, and along those lines, uh, what we're, we're thinking about doing is uh, same idea, same format in the March timeframe uh, to talk a little bit about estate planning, having a estate planning attorney on with us to talk about, you know, things you need to know and must do's and must not do's. And in the estate planning area, uh, we've seen more must not do's like you know, transferring your property, your, your real estate, putting your child on, on the deed of your property. We have seen instances of that that really create tremendous complexity. And cost. And cost, yeah. So we'll be thinking about doing that. If you have questions, um, bring them to us. We get our ideas for doing sessions like this from you, from our clients. This is a product of all the questions that, that were springing up early in the year to say, wow, what should we do about taxes? Because we know they're going to change. Well, they've changed, but not really, at least at this juncture. So you're the reason why we do this. We want to bring value to you. We want to uh, help you to make wise decisions, wise choices with your resources. So. Um, Gosh, thank you very much for your time today, the time you invested. Uh, we have, looks like 125 people who have joined us today. Uh, fabulous. We're just incredibly grateful to serve you and your family. Um, if we don't have the opportunity to wish our greetings, hearing greetings to you personally, um, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah. Today's, I believe, the first day of Hanukkah. Um, just best wishes to you and your family. Uh, cherish your kids, cherish your family. Uh, life is precious, life is sweet, and we're, we're so grateful to serve you uh, and your families. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care all. Bye-bye.